So, um, uh, welcome to this session uh, on OS Climate. Uh, OS Climate stands for Open Source Climate, for those of you that, are, that don't already uh, know of us. Um, and today I'm going to cover to you what we're doing in terms of trying to make a breakthrough in open source data and analytics to um, help solve the climate crisis with regards to accelerating climate aligned finance. So, so my name is Matt Sando. I am the Chief of Staff for OS Climate and I'm the physical risk and resilience lead. Uh, I've got over 25 years experience in finance, in, in risk management, um, most of that working for BNP Paribas Bank, and I'm currently seconded by the bank to the Open Source Climate Program. So let's um, begin by, by defining the, the problem. So the, the, in simple terms, we all know that the world is overexposed to climate risk and we're underexposed to the enablers and solutions that are going to manage this risk and get us through the carbon transition. And to, to frame the problem on very simple terms, the way to think about it is that our gro global growth is around about 90% correlated to greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to break that correlation and, and decouple carbon from, from the economy. Um, now, in terms of um, uh, the specific issues, we know that there's a significant amount of financing that needs to be driven into the transition, um, whether this is for adaptation plans, for example, or refinancing infrastructure, uh, helping oil and gas companies become green energy companies, helping navigate the supply chain investments that are going to be required to make such a dramatic transformation. Um, the other issue, of course, is that there's also um, a risk problem that we know as we navigate through the, uh, the transition and we're seeing growing changes in, uh, in physical climate events, there is a risk topic and potentially a systemic risk to the, uh, to the uh, global economy. So in, in OS Climate, uh, what we've done is uh, we have taken two actions. We, we took a view that we wanted to build a holistic data um, and analytics solution and um, in order to meet the, uh, the Paris Accord goals and uh, manage the risks. And to do that, um, secondly, we do decided to do that through a co-op. And, um, and this is leveraging and making a bridge between the research community, uh, data providers, financial institutions, um, and, um, and, and so on there. So that's our, um, our OS Climate commitment. In terms of uh, the ecosystem, so what does our ecosystem look like? So on the left-hand side, we've got the community that I just spoke about, comprising the data providers, banks, asset managers, research, NGOs. Um, and um, in the middle, we have the, uh, the data problem. So we know we're going to need a significant amount of data to address this, uh, uh, this climate challenge, whether that's data on carbon footprints, whether that's data describing climate hazards, uh, whether that's data describing future potential transition pathways. Uh, there is a data problem and, there's a, and that data is not going to come from a single source. Um, we believe that data is going to come from multiple sources uh, around the world and that needs to be managed appropriately. Um, on the right hand side, the, um, the OS Climate Solution is around three analytical tools and I'm going to drill into these in, in more detail. Um, firstly, in the top left of that box, uh, we have the alignment tools, which are tools which help asset managers demonstrate whether the investments they're making are aligned with the Paris Agreement. On the, um, the top right-hand side, we have the physical risk and resilience stream, which is a, a program where we're looking at um, mechanisms to, to identify and measure the risk in the system um, to climate change, so how we address more wildfires, more droughts, uh, chronic heat changes, uh, wind events, and, uh, and so on. And in the bottom, uh, we, um, we are performing also um, transition analysis and we've, um, we've released some open source tooling for that which helps the world understand uh, the potential different economic pathways to, to the right resolution to decarbonising the world. So three core analytical projects and uh, one data one. Our membership, um, we were founded by BNP Paribas, Alliance, Goldman Sachs and Amazon uh, Web Services and, um, and we now have built up a, um, a, a few other asset manager members such as Amundi, um, we have uh, London Stock Exchange, BNY Mellon and then we have uh, 
Uh, alongside Amazon, we have uh, Red Hat, who are key partners in particular in the data project. And on the bottom there, you'll see also some partners that are um, research institutions or, um, or data providers. So OS Climate, we're a member-driven non-profit non organization. So if we quickly frame the, um, the problem, if you are an investment manager, you need to make commitments about decarbonizing your portfolio. And um, these are going to rely on absolutely imperatively accurate carbon footprint data in the, uh, in the corporate domain. So, for example, if you're lending money to a, to a construction company, you need to understand their scope one, two, three uh, emissions. And we also be able, need to make forward-looking predictions on what those emissions are going to look like. Um, then asset managers, people managing money, are going to need to in, uh, manage their client reporting in terms of um, being able to use highly trusted models and um, tell their investees where their money's going. That also is governed by extreme, uh, extremely rigorous compliance rules. Um, in the middle there, you've got your risk analyst. So the risk analyst needs to understand the, uh, the risk in the portfolio. And, um, and this introduces the concept which has sort of been introduced into finance in the last few years, where we actually have to connect climate data to economic data to be able to make an economic inference on the, um, on, on the assets that are being invested in. And on the right-hand side, we have the procurement officers um, and regulatory compliance officers. So, so it's a data problem on the two on the right-hand side, a data management problem, and on the three on the left-hand side are very much the use cases around uh, investing. So let's just quickly recap, if I'm talking to you about climate change, before we dig too deep, um, let me, I'm not a climate scientist, but I'm going to give you a very quick overview of what we talk about when we talk about future projections of, of climate conditions. Um, the, the best way of thinking about the way that climate models work is that we break down the Earth's surface and then above that Earth's surface we, we create little cubes going up into the stratosphere. And, um, and based on various emission cycles, um, water and carbon cycles, uh, an energy balance is performed and these are the, each cube is mathematically solved uh, between one another in order to derive um, the, uh, the, the, the temperature conditions around the globe. And from that, models can be used to derive the wind conditions, rain conditions, sea ice melt, et cetera, et cetera. And that's pretty much the way that these, um, these models are operating. What's fundamentally important here is that these models are looking into the future. So it's not just about a retrospect of what did the weather look like last year. It's how are things going to progressively worsen over time. And these, these need to be modeled under various different greenhouse gas emission cycles. Let me, oh. Okay, now you may not be able to view this slide too well, but it's nothing. Um, it's not a. It, it's not too much of an issue because what I all I wanted to introduce for you here is the concept that um, because it, because there could be some financial instability in the system, um, the regulators have got together to define their context of the potential instability that could come as we try to manage our way through the transition, and I think this is great because it really helps everybody understand what we're facing. Fundamentally, if you look at that top, if you look at that grey line, rising line up in the up in the top left-hand side, the thick grey, this is a scenario at which emissions continue to grow, and um, the uh, the temp global temperatures rise beyond three degrees um, out beyond the uh, the 2050 time horizon. So that's like a do nothing scenario, and then you've got a, a smooth dark green line. That's, um, that's an orderly transition. So if we get everything right and we model everything perfectly, we can enter into an orderly transition, which should be the most economically viable and probably the most friendly to the global south in terms of uh, socio-economic impacts. Um, but what the regulators also looked at, they said, well, if we're delayed in making these transition decisions, uh, we need to also take into account the, the perspective of very volatile announcements in policy. And, um, and so that lighter green um, thick line where you can see the sudden downward um, drop in, in carbon emissions is, uh, is exactly that sort of scenario. So that's called a disorderly transition. So if you make your way over to the right-hand side of that scenario, you'll see these four boxes. 
So in the, uh, in the case of the, um, the do nothing scenario in grey, we have a lot of physical risk, which is the bottom right hand side of this graph. So we expect to see worsening climate events, more wildfires, more frequent rain events, more frequent wind events, and we're not transitioning at all. So that's um, referred to as a, as a hothouse world. Um, if everything goes perfectly, we end up in the bottom left hand square with an orderly transition with still some degree of physical risk because we know no matter what we do, we're still facing rising temperatures at the moment. And obviously disorderly um, will we'll create much more transition risk, much more volatility in the system. And that's going to be much harder for finance to navigate because the decisions of who to lend to have to be modelled around potential extremely volatile policy decisions and, um, and, uh, and uh, corporate action. That's by the NGFS, by the way, if anybody wants to look that up. So I said I'd talk through the, um, the four work streams of OS climate. Let's, um, let's step through these one by one. So um, the Sector Alignment Project is a project that's led by Alliance. And, um, and if, you, if you're lucky enough to have money or have investments or have a pension fund, then you'd probably be interested to know where your money's invested. So obviously what we're trying to do here is by using um, carbon footprint simulations, we want to try to get a flavour of um, what's the temperature of a portfolio. So are you invested in a one and a half degree pathway, a two degree pathway or a four or five degree pathway? If your investment fund is full of heavily carbon intensive companies that are not making any effort to transition, you're going to be up in that top red orange zone. Um, we all want our investment portfolios, of course, to be in the, uh, in the bottom zone. Note, of course, that this is a temporal topic, right? Um, it's not necessarily about the emissions today. It's about capital expenditure, capex commitments, in terms of where we expect those footprints to be reducing in the future. So the, um, uh, the, the project, what we, what we decided to do in OS Climate is we wanted to open up the toolbox and release open source code that, um, that connects to our data, um, data mesh architecture and, um, and we're able to demonstrate where companies are aligned or not. So are they, meet, are they behind their carbon budget or are they ahead of their carbon budget? And, and, and we believe that um, this, we would much rather be releasing this into the open domain so we can have a global collaboration and reach a consensus on the methodology that can be uh, deployed. So a quick um, summary of, of this project, this is only a two slider. So what we're doing is we're ob objectively assessing the emission targets of companies and their projections. Um, we're, we're able to compare different decarbonisation scenarios um, on the platform and um, we're trying to create a little bit of independence away from commercial data providers that provide this sort of measurement and um, sort of open up that black box. The, um, the, the benefit for sure is that, um, is that we think that these computations need to be as transparent as possible. No model is perfect, but let's make them as transparent as possible. Okay, uh, complicated slide here, but um, we're not going to go into it in too much detail. The, uh, the second project um, that OS Climate is working on is a project that's led by Capgemini. And, um, the, this is the transition scenario tool. It's the one I introduced at the beginning. So I, I've already introduced you the concept of different greenhouse gas pathways, different, different speeds and paces at which the world is going to decarbonise. And um, we still don't know the, 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 um, the, the optimal pathway that the, um, the world is going to follow. We don't know how policy is going to unfold. We don't know about technology, innovation. Uh, we don't necessarily know the energy mix of the future. So. How, how can banks, investors, lenders make, to make the right decisions of, um, of in, in investing and lending in the right decarbonisation um, zone? Um, and how can corporates themselves make the decision of how to transform their entire supply chains um, without going bust in the, uh, in the process? So the idea of, um, of the, the modelling that's been released, um, we've, we, we've released this integrated assessment model into the, um, into the open domain. And um, the idea is that it's known as a system of systems model. And um, very simply, it takes into consideration population, takes into consideration there is a finite amount of natural resources. Um, and in different energy system, different energy models are able to be mod mod modelled. So are we talking about more, um, more solar, more wind, more hydro? 
um, and, um, and the macroeconomic conditions around that are, um, are then defined um, based on uh, different policy scenarios. So it's a full simulated engine um, at, on a global scale, enabling us to, um, to make some different scenario inferences um, of the way we may decarbonize the world in the future. I think I've covered all of that one. And again, I think the, the concept is that this, is, while some of it may be commercialised as a commercial service to go and do some advisory work for particular corporates or financial investors, firms, the idea of putting it in OS Climate is that we have a, 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 an open layer for input and um, collaborators, um, collaborations from the expert community. Okay, so I've talked about um, two projects that are very um, connected to transition risk about the decarbonisation of the world. Um, what I haven't yet talked about is the physical climate risk piece. So what do I mean by physical risk? Um, if you think in the most simple terms, if you are a lender or investor and you're going to make a decision on lending money to a farm that could be um, caught, caught up in rising drought conditions, rising flood, or you're about to issue a mortgage on a property that's on the coast and could be underwater in 20 or 30 years' time, um, that's the context of physical risk. And, um, and, and so this is, a, this is a very serious topic. Even though some of these issues might only become apparent in 20, 30 years' time, what we're starting to see is as the world, as our ability to model changing climate conditions in the future improves, we're going to start to assign, associate that risk into the asset values that we see today. And as you've probably seen already in the news, um, you know, there's going to be areas of the world where you can't get a mortgage, uh, you can't get insurance on a property, and, um, and uh, th this is going to be a, a, a certainly an area of growing concern. So, so we have to make sure that our assets are correctly valued uh, around the globe. So, so if you are a lender um, or an investor, what, what are your use cases? Well. We know we have to disclose our risks and our strategy around how we are managing uh, climate risk ourselves. We know we need to be able to measure and assess our portfolio risk under different scenarios because we don't know what the future looks like. Um, we also know we need tools on the top right there for origination. So how are we going to decide to lend or invest in a particular project finance or the mortgage example I just gave you or the hotel chain on the coast? Um, we need tools that will help us um, make those inferences on investments. Operational risk, we also have our own operational risks, um, even in the finance community, um, if, uh, if um, sites get shut down because uh, wind takes out the power or wildfires take out the local cellular network, um, you know, the operations drop, uh, shutting down um, causes a strain on disaster recovery mechanisms and these themselves have to now factor in potential growing climate change conditions. Also for strategic planning, we're not likely to double or triple the, um, the size of an office in a location that's likely to suffer more um, degraded climate conditions in the future. And then on the bottom right, the, um, the, the main ambition of what we want to achieve in, in, in OS climate is that if you can measure the risk, then you can manage the risk. So by, by measuring the level of physical risk uh, on, these, on these assets and potential investments, that will lead to adaptation finance. So you, you've already heard about adaptation finance in the carbon transition world. So a bank can finance an oil company to, to invest in green energy, or a bank can finance um, a, a company to decommission uh, a carbon intensive plant. Um, but there's less investment, in, in less money flow moving towards resilience and adaptation. So how do you measure physical risk? Well, fundamentally, we, um, we take these building blocks on the, um, on the left-hand side. So we start with a climate hazard. This is the hazard model that describes in a temporal and spatial domain the probability of an event happening. So for example, if we take a longitude and latitude in California where there's a power plant, um, we, um, uh, we can see the probability of drought or high air temperatures impacting that plant. Um, if you, you can measure the exposure by matching those climate models onto the asset locations, so you know that the, my investment is exposed or not exposed to these climate conditions. 
But then there's this really fundamentally important third building block, which is the vulnerability piece. And the vulnerability piece is describing how impacted those assets will be. For example, a, a power plant suffering growing um, drought conditions where it can't draw water off the river or high air temperatures where it's having to shut down is going to be much more vulnerable than a warehouse or a IT software services company. So we try to build a library of these vulnerability models. And ultimately, if you can put those building blocks together, you can build a risk distribution upon which you can make um, a, an investment or credit decision. And, and if you think about what I've just explained, the majority of those blocks sit in the non-competitive space. So we believe that this is rife for pre-competitive collaboration, and it's only the, the final 5% of this modelling that needs to be taken inside a bank's proprietary credit or pricing or decision-making systems. And this ecosystem sits on top of the data, um, commons data mesh that I'm going to explain a little bit later. Um, accessed through a, um, a data exchange. So you can see a couple of examples on the right hand side there where um, you know, on a simple perspective we can just map out a heat map where, um, where an asset may have a larger exposure to coastal flood or potentially um, riverine flooding. And on the bottom right there um, you will see the, um, uh, uh, the chronic heat uh, model that we, we released a few months ago where we are doing two things um, with chronic heat. We are, we are trying to build a picture for where um, areas of the world will have to shut down because heat conditions are simply too severe uh, for long periods of time. So that's the chronic average rising temperatures. But what we're also looking at, in, and you're probably going to hear more about it in the news, in terms of the, um, the combined humidity measurement. So when you actually combine humidity with temperature, you come up with what's called a wet bowl. Um, temperature measurement and that effectively is the rate at which the body can sweat to cool itself down. So if you have a huge amount of manual labour that the workforce is going to go slower and slower and slower and obviously there's a certain wet bulb temperature where you actually reach death but before you reach death you're gonna, your work's going to slow down or probably be disrupted. So this is the sort of thing that we're implementing in the open domain in, in OS Climate. And here is a, a wind model that we've literally just, uh, just um, introduced this week. So this is a great example of um, collaboration with, um, with uh, universities. Um, this one is coming from, is coming from Imperial College in, in London. And um, we've just taken their wind system model uh, for tropical cyclones, which is um, giving us a feel for um, where the areas of the world are going to suffer high sustained wind speed risks. And obviously, as a bank lender perspective, we can now match those, um, those, those climate hazards onto our mortgage portfolio, for example, or whatever we, uh, we need to do there. If I get a chance, I'll demo that. But what you're looking at there is, um, is an open sandbox. Um, it's, uh, it's available in, to the public. So probably a lot of you attending an open source summit will, will be wondering, well, what where's the commercial layer in everything you're, you're talking about? So I've talked about the need for financial institutions to collaborate because banks don't, didn't have any climate science knowledge a few, a, f a few years ago. And we didn't know how to optimize geospatial files. So using cl collaboration is, is a perfect case of, um, of sharing the, um, the workload. But, um, but what we're expecting to do as well is by building um, a common coding ecosystem at a base layer, we can plug in more advanced commercial models on top of the same platform. So what OS Climate is doing is creating a plug and play environment where um, very precise commercial models can be plugged in just as easily as, uh, as open models. So in the example of what I've just explained to you about a mortgage, um, let's imagine that's a loan to a, a multi-billion uh, hotel chain you can use an open model that's going to give you an indication of whether that's at risk or not, but you're probably going to want to purchase a damage function from an insurer um, and a more advanced one square meter resolution flood model just to be sure that you really understand those risks before you hit the, uh, the invest button. So, so, um, so it's sort of a modular plug and play environment giving space for commercial data providers to also work with us. 
What we're also going to look at in OS Climate as well is the concept that what I've explained to you today is, is all about single asset risks. Um, but there's also the concept of catastrophe modelling, which some of you may be familiar with, which looks at scenario events. So if you use catastrophe modelling, these are the um, climate models that describe scenario events. For example, we can create a massive flood event across Europe for one season. And it, that, that appears as a scenario block, and you can overlay that scenario block onto a mortgage lend, lend loan portfolio and to take a view on whether the portfolio is likely to suffer a big valuation uh, deterioration. OK, so just a, a couple of minutes on, on data commons and data mesh. So we've talked about the three tools. Um, the, the data layer has been um, executed by Red Hat. And um, obviously, I'm talking, about, I'm talking to you from the financial institution perspective. I'm not going to be presenting this at a, at a technical level at all. But basically, Red Hat have taken the uh, decision to um, uh, deploy a data mesh um, architecture for this, for this solution. And, um, and, this, and as a recap to the, uh, to the ecosystem, of OS Climate, you can sort of see the scale of the problem. So on the left-hand side there, you see all these multiple different data sources that need to be federated. Um, there's never going to be one central database where everything's stored. Um, so we choose the, um, the, the data federation model, um, where um, you can have a federated governance approach and um, use, um, use the latest uh, uh, technology to then fire those in, um, whether they're APIable or, or other mechanisms, into the uh, the tools that we're um, we're talking to you about building. So, um, so let's drill into a couple of those points. So, the way that Red Hat will uh, talk to you about this is, and some of you are probably aware, they they refer to uh, treating data as a product. Um, that's uh, one of the concepts of a, of a data mesh architecture, um, and. Um, the, the idea is that what you, your, your data consumers are considered your customers. So if you can frame your, your tooling, your mesh um, functionality around individual use cases, then you're, you're better meeting the needs. For example, a data provider uh, on the left-hand side here, um, a data provider may actually be a commercial data provider. And um, what they can do through, a, um, through the, the governance platform is set the rules of who gets to view that commercial data. So where does it get distributed to through the, uh, through the federation model? And that's fundamentally important in terms of the way we can actually distribute commercial and um, public data through, through the platform. The, um, some of the other principles or related to what I've just mentioned is um, it, the Red Hat talk about the, um, the importance of a self-service architecture. And um, the idea is that this it doesn't take a huge amount of coding, um, you know, uh, complex skills in order to replicate um, models because Red Hat have opened up all the patterns. So if Red Hat have a pattern which can be APIable and replicated, it's much easier to onboard new data sets in, uh, in the mesh, uh, which is all open source, by the way, so anybody can create their instance of, uh, of the data mesh. Um, the, the second principle is this decentralized product ownership. And um, what, what, this, what this enables us to do is, um, is it, it sort of de it, 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 it's a federated governance model, so, it, so um, well, it, 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 I'll come to that in a minute, actually. The decentralization means that the mesh can keep track of the lineage and changes in data sources uh, and metadata and um, put that through the same sort of um, uh, rigorous governance as, um, as you would do if it was code. So, um, so, so beyond that principle, if you, it, there's also a fundamentally um, useful principle that because you're federating the data rather than copying it um, into a lake, for example, um, the, um, the governance and controls ma mostly maintained at the original source layer. And obviously overlaying on top of that is a federated governance model where you can sort of set some open standards, set some principles around how to treat um, that data. In fact, we, we use a data as code context. And, um, and then um, 
that enables you to set a macro level of ruling under which um, a data provider can set their own rules, but within a common framework. And um, Red Hat sort of left me with this slide, which, um, which I probably try not to explain as, it's, as, it's, uh, as I'm not the data expert, but in principle, this is why they like the mesh architecture, because, because really that federated data governments model is much simpler to manage and maintain um, SQL-based interfaces and um, a, a distributed cloud model, which basically is also super useful in this environment because actually there's going to be a lot of data sources um, that, that can't be centralised. Um, governments, countries of the world will actually want their data to stay where it belongs. So if, for example, you're the Singapore government, you want your Singapore companies to disclose under your particular disclosure rules you don't want that data being centralised somewhere in Europe or, or the United States. Hence the beauty of a, of a, of a, of a federating, uh, federated model. Um, you can keep the data where it is and port it through to those people that need to see it. And what I mean by that in the sense is that data might be completely public, but also data might need to be shared between one supply chain um, or up and down the supply chain, or it might need to be shared between our a, um, a lender and the investors. So in my example, if you're an investor in Europe, you might, you might be given the access rights to see the data that the Singapore company is disclosing. And for those of you that are, are into the open source, that's the architecture. I'm going to leave you with those slides. Um, everything is open source. Uh, in particular, there um, uh, you've got Trino on the Federation side. And this is a little summary on, um, on the mesh pattern. Uh, the principles that, um, that we're working on is really availability, reliability, and comparability. And as a, as a closing remark, the, uh, the context of what, what Red Hat have designed here is data agnostic. And so whilst it's actually super useful for managing this extremely complicated climate problem, uh, it's just as relevant to the biodiversity and nature um, challenge that we have, which is an even more immature field. Um, and in fact, um, the, uh, the WWF have picked up on this and have written a very interesting paper um, describing how it could be a very good idea to deploy a, um, uh, the OS climate mesh for, for biodiversity and nature. So that's a summary of our ecosystem. Um, you know, transparency is really at our core, um, we, and very much we're, you can see that we've sort of presented you an end-to-end -end, uh, solution today. That's, um, that's the approach that we think is much easier to bring in collaborators from academia and um, having them bridge between, um, between financial community. And um, what I would say as well is that I'm, I'm, I think I'm preaching um, um, to the preacher, but you know, collaboration clearly uh, is what's required in this urgent call for action. 90% um, of this problem is pre-competitive in, in our view. Um, transparency is at our core. Um, biodiversity data mesh could be a very good idea. And um, as a final word, um, we will be in COP um, uh, later this year. But also, if you want to get involved, we are on the lookout for BAs, data engineers, data scientists, um, React experts, um, and, um, and there's also opportunities to volunteer which are extending into the public space. Um, so for example, when I've talked to you about uh, physical um, climate risk, uh, the model that a bank needs when it's lending money to a farm is the same model that can be used in Nigeria to look at the resilience and adaptability of, um, of farming uh, of crops over there. And in fact, uh, we have a project underway today where there's a hackathon which is looking to empower the youth data scientists in Nigeria um, using the OS climate ecosystem and, um, and uh, adapting our model specifically to the, uh, to the crops over in, over in Africa. And we hope that approach is going to be scalable as well um, across the rest of the rest of Africa. So thanks very much. I think I'm just on time, and I'll hand over for a couple of minutes of questions. Right. Do you think it's having the correct effect, or is like to drive investment into adaptation and transition, or 
could there be an unintended consequence of it actually driving investment to be in the safe spaces of it? Yeah, I mean, look, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot to say about that. Um, first of all, this is not just about risk, this is also about opportunities, that there are huge opportunities in the carbon transition. There's opportunities to make the right loans and to have a very successful business, right? So, it's so, so having the ability to model and understand that is important. Um, the, the, the context of um, shying away from risk um, is certainly an interesting one. Um, the, uh, but the way that a lot of financial institutions would look at it is they say, well, we want to support our clients in their adaptation. So if we identify that a client is at risk because they're going to be caught in the wrong pathway, we will be approaching them and saying, you know, would you like some transition finance to change your business model? So that's also a, trans it's also a finance opportunity. So, so you don't really want to abandon your clients necessarily. Um, some financial institutions may, of course, want to abandon those that have made absolutely no commitments at all to, uh, to decarbonising their portfolio. Um, so, so, yeah, it's a good question. Um, and uh, it's the same question that the insurance industry has about the mutualisation of insurance. You know, do, you, do you reprice mortgages um, in areas of, uh, of high flood risk? Um, or do you mutualise it across uh, the, the entire um, you know, mortgage portfolio? Um, it's yet to be seen, um, but again, I would hope that that also leads to adaptation finance. So you, you measure the risk first, then you identify the adaptation possibilities. So you would hope that as our ability to measure this improves, there would be connections to the governments of the world, the, the regional planners, to actually make the uh, adaptation strategies and plans that also need to feed back into the models so, so the, the, the lenders know that there are no longer risks. It's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic and there's a lot still to be done on it. How quickly do you see some of these things happening? There's already uh, some of the insurance companies are exiting Florida because of the risks there to hurricanes and rising you know, temperatures. Um, and and they're not waiting for the sea to rise. They're exiting now. Um, yeah. So is this a problem that we're solving today, or is this a problem in the future? Well, I, th I think that through the sort of projects like we're doing in OS Climate, um, w we can bring some vision and transparency to how the future is going to look, which, which means that we will have the capacity to probably value these assets um, in the next five years, I would say, is my gut feeling. I think where there'll be a reorganization of, uh, of, of risk. So, so a problem in 30 years' time is actually a problem for me in the next five years. For if you're a big investor, lender, you've got a big portfolio, you need to understand uh, its, its, its composition and where it could have risks. And then, yeah, the context is then how do you support those regions then needs to be the topic of moving to the moving to the governments and regional planners and um, and insurance associations um, looking at it may also be the birth of you know new reinsurance um, pro pro products um, because it's going to be maybe a series of uh, you know catastrophe type um, bonds which actually might allow the governments to still provide the insurance buffers in some of those areas so um, I know, for example, in the UK, the, um, the insurance buffer uh, orchestrated by the government runs out in 2039, and at that point there could be 300,000 properties that are no longer insurable. So something's got to happen, right? And it's the same thing we're seeing in America as well. So again, a, another really interesting topic, and hopefully we're bringing, that, bringing it to the forefront. Which one, IP? Not sure about that. Not sure about that one. But we are, in terms of the climate modelling, climate science, we're mostly 
onboarding pre-peer-reviewed -peer models. We're, we're trying not to build our own. Um, the, the only thing we're doing from time to time is we are restructuring or packaging files that are downscaled from NASA. Um, for example, if you're, if, you're in, if, you, if, you're into your, if you're into your climate topics, um, you know, when the IPCC released their latest series of climate models known as AR6, and that's a brilliant report if anyone hasn't, hasn't read it, um, they, um, they, they, um, uh, NASA took hold of those data sets and downscaled, for example, the heat and, and drought um, uh, indexes. And um, we've taken those and structured them in the way that can be um, applied to finance. Because th the problem was today is even though it was just a few, it was a few years ago when actually economists and climate scientists started working together. So if you go back 15, 20 years, everyone was working in silos. So we've already seen one wonderful thing. And, and now we're sort of, by, by having an open collaboration like this that bridges world-class technology, financial institutions, research, we can actually start to um, collaborate much faster with research institutions because they can see those practical use cases. Because, like I said, a lot of the models are just not usable today to make those decisions. So we have to restructure and play with them. But what we hope is that the world sees that and then the research community adapts the way that they are thinking about uh, models, in particular around the concept of uncertainty, because that's not necessarily something that's, that's thought about in the, in the commercial provider space today, where you will get an answer of X if you purchase a, a climate model from somebody, whereas what we want to see is the uncertainty behind those measurements and be able to get a flavor for what that means. So, so yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great area to be in, um, but I, I think that we will probably steer clear of doing too much modeling directly by ourselves. We'll stay at that sort of package level. Great, I think we're over time. So um, I'll, I'll stick around for a few minutes if anyone wants to grab me afterwards, but uh, thank you very much, everyone.